So, yesterday's class uh, we were talking about dispersion modeling the parameters. So, one of the parameters is the emission rate and uh, you go back to this emission rate is a combination of emission factor and the activity rate. So, the emission factor is uh, something that needs to be determined for every, pro every pollutant for every process and this is the uh, source for that. This is a large compilation of this uh, US EPA has this, this is called as AP42, it is fairly uh, common. This is a compilation of one set of emission factors, but people are always deriving emission factors, measuring emission factors for various uh, things. For example, there are certain things that, that are here that are not used in India or in some other countries. There are certain things in India which are not used elsewhere, so AP42 will not have some of that. For example, uh, if you want to know the uh, emission factor for burning biomass or burning wood for cooking or something like that, which is not very common in, in the US, uh, people use it for different purposes. So, uh, so here we, uh, there are a lot of people in rural areas still uh, heat water using uh, whatever is available locally and also cook sometimes, uh, now, but then there is also LPG and all that now it is uh, expanded. So, any emission that occurs from any process for whatever parameters is listed here and it is a growing list. Okay. So, so here we will look at this uh, for, for stationary point and area sources as I mentioned yesterday. So, these are very fixed things. For example, you will see the example when you say stationary point fixed thing is for a, the first chapter it, say, it says is external combustion sources. And you can look at all the categories, the external combustion sources, the solid waste disposal, stationary internal combustion sources, evaporation loss sources, petroleum industry, organic chemical process industry and so on, it keeps going, greenhouse gas, biogenic sources and so on. So, it, so you take a look at the first one, it's external combustion sources. So, in this there is a large set of categories, you can see it keeps going, it is about 11 categories. The first one is uh, bituminous and subbituminous coal combustion. Anthracite coal combustion, there are different types of coal, fuel oil combustion, natural gas combustion, LPG combustion. So, if you take L LPG combustion uh, for example, or wood residue combustion in boilers, lignite combustion. So, some of this is applicable in, in different places, they can adapt it straight away. So, what this will give you is residential fireplaces, is not very commonly used in India, do not use indoor uh, fireplaces. Lot of people use uh, uh, in outdoors in winter, not in North India, people may use something outdoors. Indoors, a lot of electrical heaters have replaced many of these things. So, let us look at one of them. For example, say anthracite coal combustion. So, it gives a general description of the process. What is the combustion process? This is very important because the emission factor depends on that. How you burn the coal is important, and, uh, and what is the coal? What is the description? Firing practices. So, this is by itself, each one of these chapters can become a a large body of work. Okay. So, people do research uh, and they do say they will study just the emission factor of one particular thing and that is that. So, so the emissions and everything we have learned in this course comes here because we, we, when you do emission factor analysis we need to measure it which means you need to monitor. How do you monitor and what is the objective of monitoring because you need to exactly measure your burning at grams of, of, of fuel, what is it that is coming out? All of it that is coming out you need to capture and you need to capture it accurately and so this is, uh, this all comes there. So, here we have emissions are particulate matter known emissions. So, sometimes there may be unknown emissions, you do not know what they are. Unless you close the mass balance, you do not know what is it, you may have to do that. So, the known emissions particulate matter, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, four major things. And controls, so, this is control is part of the equipment so at the practice of doing it. For example, in industries when you are burning something, you have an emission control because you know this emission exists, then you put a control, then you see what is the emission after the control. So, where 80 percent of the emission is removed, this is what is without the control, this is with the control. So, that makes a case for having control and uh, those kind of things. So, now for you can look at NOx compound from uncontrolled anthracite coal combustors. Uncontrolled means there is nothing, you have not attached any combustion uh, control equipment for SO2 and NOx and SOx. So, it says then again on the first column you can see stoker fired boiler, it is some kind of boiler. You can go and read what that is back in the section. What is a stoker fired boiler? What is an FBC boiler? It is not important for this discussion, but it gives you 
So for Stoker fire boilers, the emission factor is pounds per ton, Lb per ton is 339. This S and B uh, refer to some weight percent sulphur and all that. So okay, so 39 pounds per ton of coal combusted, and NOx is 9 pounds per ton. So this is a number. Yeah, but you have to remember that based on our quality control thing, this number is a single number. <coughs> it doesn't have plus minus something. But usually, it will have something. So they are reporting average numbers, and this you can use this as a guideline, okay, um, for designing. So so on. So if you keep going further down, it says carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So even though carbon dioxide is not a pollutant in the classic, in the sense that we are talking about, but it's still listed because now it's become an important. Uh, um, emission fact, people want to know how much carbon dioxide is coming out and there is particulate matter PM, filterable PM. So the definition of filterable PM is given in the document, it is PM10, sometimes it is listed as PM10 which means you are using a PM10 device to collect what is coming off, so which means it is PM10, so PM2.5 and so on. So you can collect whatever you want and that becomes an emission factor for that particular process. So in the dispersion model, you want to get, get emission rate, you say I am going to use, I am going to find out the emission rate for coal combustion, you need to know the emission factor. All the information for emission factor you need to gather and then find the emission factor from a source like this and then find out how long are you going to operate it, operating at what activity rate, 1000 tons per day or and that is the rate at which it is going. If you are going to do dispersion model for 1 hour, then what is the activity rate for 1 hour and what is the emission rate in that 1 hour, that has to be estimated. There are a few other things, then there is emission factor controlled, mass, okay, these are some other things that are listed here and so on. There are a few other compounds, other than the priority present, there is acinaphthene, naphthene, anthocene, the PAHS, a few other things, so people have found out uh, these things, okay. So this has to be done, one people do this under experimental conditions where they will burn a certain amount of thing, collect everything, sometimes they want to do it in the uh, in the real scenario which they will go and measure the actual emissions and that is very tricky to do, but measurement of actual emissions is in the open, exposed to air and it is difficult to measure that, so that there are ways of doing it, but it is uh, filled with lot of uncertainties, so there are other things people measure, so the entire thing. So you get the idea of how, uh, so you can have any number of sections here, so this is just one set of things, this, this is point sources, there is another large uh, set of um, emission factors which are from vehicles, the vehicles are considered as part of a line source, so there are roads which are full, full of vehicles, so emission is occurring <coughs> from a main highway, major highway or a city road. So you need to know how many vehicles are there and each vehicle has a certain emission factor, okay. So again you can imagine the emission factors for vehicles, how we uh, see this uh, list of emission factors that you are seeing, this is uh, CO2, this is for CO2, but you can do this for other, the other pollutants that we are interested in. So this is a small type of car, the problem here in vehicles is you have to, there are large category of vehicles. This, uh, the, the category of vehicles say cars for example, say 800 cc cars, 1000 cc cars, 1400 cc, big ones, 2500 cc, 3000 and so on, it keeps going and they are fuel, gasoline, petrol, sometimes some of them have CNG, some of them have LPG, some of them have diesel and uh, there are different kind of engines for each kind of fuel and each kind of fuel composition is different, so when it combusts its emission is different. So you have to get that, uh, in this particular document they have only given uh, for carbon dioxide but everything, you can look at benzene, toluene, xylene, uh, hydrocarbons, PM, SO2, NO2, SOx, NOx, particulate matter, everything uh, and ozone that is coming out of that. So ARAI is uh, the one of the, the main organizations that uh, so they do a lot of work on this, they also measure the uh, emission factors, they have a, uh, they have a rig where they run the vehicle, they do not, it is not done on road, it's done, it is like the instrument detection limit, it is done under test conditions, it is run on the road, on, the, uh, on the, this thing, because when you go on the road, what you measure can include other things from other places, so we just want to look at what is coming from the vehicle alone, 
under pristine conditions, new conditions. When the engine becomes old and all that, it becomes it deteriorates. It doesn't perform the way it's supposed to. Okay. So this also is under before the. Uh, if you have a control device like a catalytic converter, without that and with that, what is the emission control and so on. So, ARAI is the organization in India that does that because Indian vehicles are very different, slightly different from the ones that are sold elsewhere. So, their um, the fuel is different. See, a lot of it matters the fuel. The fuel that comes is refined in India and there are certain fractions of it, uh, they are all not the same. So, it varies from batch to batch and varies from. Um, company to company and all that. So, the, they are not exactly the same. So, there is a range in which the emission factors exist in these kind of things. Okay. So, for anything you get emission factors. This is for point sources. We will come to other things which are what we call as fugitive emissions. Okay. Fugitive emissions, there is a um, These are unplanned emissions. See, these fugitive emissions are, uh, as the name suggests, fugitive means they are escaping. Escaping means, for example, there is a pipeline. They're supposed to carry some gas, some, some fuel. There is a leak. There is a joint, and there is a leak here. That's a fugitive emission. That's fugitive emissions. Okay. So these are the things like for if you have a con you have a gas tank or a gas pipe. They are leaking. You always see things are leaking. If you go to industry and all that, so these are fugitive emissions, and people try to estimate fugitive emissions. Okay, so this estimation of this is again not easy. It depends on uh, <coughs> several things. So there are people have developed equations to find out is so the pressure of the gas is this much, ambient temperature is this much, temperature is this much. What is going to be the estimated uh, release through uh, some of these things? Okay, so those are something else. The other class of emissions that uh, are important is uh, things like there is uh, soil or there is water, some surface, some natural surface which contains a chemical. So, we have rho A2 in water or Wa3, soil is polluted or water is contaminated. There is going to be a, a release, an emission into air. For example, if soil is contaminated, what is the air pollution impact of that? So, that requires, it is not a point source, it could be an area source, could be what, what we call as a volume source. But the, the, the way in which we determine the uh, Q for that is by estimating the flux multiplied by the area. And the estimation of this flux here requires you, requires information of the, the mechanism by which it happens is the a convective or a diffusive mass transfer flux. So, that entire section we will do it uh, in the next section of this discussion after we finish this portion uh, as interface mass transfer uh, problem. So, we will talk about that separately and there is a large uh, section of problems in that <coughs> and it relates to interface tra mass transfer from different phases not just to air. But it gives you a context in which why we are doing that since we know this. So, so, if we want to estimate what is the effect of uh, an oil spill in water, air pollution impact. So, some, some, some tanker has overturned into a river or a sea or a lake, what is the air pollution impact immediately? So, you have a lot of uh, oil sitting there and it is going to evaporate and what is the, so this is now a source and you can apply the dispersion model to this source, but to estimate Q you need to apply those equations to so, each one of these terms in the uh, uh, in the uh, dispersion model you have to, we talked about five this parameters, each one of these parameters you have to estimate it independently and then plug it into the uh, dispersion model to get rho A y. So, what we, how do we apply this? Um, so, there is one more, uh, this is incomplete, there is one more addition to this. So, normally when we are looking at this uh, plume, we said that the plume is at a height h from the ground, right? which means that at some point it is going to hit the ground if it is spreading like this. So, what happens when it hits the ground? Well, how The ground is rigid, so most of the plumes will reflect back into the surface. So, what will happen is this, you are expecting a, a profile like this, okay? you are expecting a Gaussian profile like this, where it is 0 at one end of the plume and 
in the middle it is the highest concentration. But when the plume reflects what you see is that this, this end has some additional concentration because this reflected plume is now adding on. So, this plume is now is supposed to go here, but it has nowhere to go. So, this entire mass adds on to this section. So, it is a little more complicated than this. This is a very simplistic way of doing it. When it reflects, it does not go back in the same velocity and all that. There is a loss of energy and all that. And the plume itself may, some of it can get adsorbed. Whatever pollutant is coming can get adsorbed onto the soil surface and nothing, air may go back, but the pollutant may not go out. So, but not considering all of that, just uh, assuming that all of it bounces back and mixes with the rest of the air coming in. So, there is a, there is a plume that is naturally coming into this direction and this and this adds to that and therefore you see that there is it is not symmetric anymore <coughs> uh, this this part is nicely gaussian uh, normal distribution but this part is slightly more because there is this is what is the original one and then there is a small additional contribution coming from the reflected plume okay so how do you incorporate this into the dispersion model uh, people have done something very smart about this and simple uh, this thing is that they imagine there is a second store which is below the ground minus h and it keeps going and it is the same height. So, this plume whatever is being reflected it is the same volume that is being uh, added here. So, what we are doing is we are adding the contribution of two sources one which at a height h the other one at height of minus h okay. But this the contribution from the second one only comes into play after we cross this point. Till that point we are not even measuring this. How do we measure the concentration of this one? I have to measure rho a 1 x y z h, but this z now has to be uh, minus 10 meters then I will be able to calculate that, but I am never going to calculate minus h minus 10 I am not interested in minus 10 because it is an imaginary plume. So, under the ground I do not care what happens to it. I am I am only going to be interested in something above the ground this is all z is always greater than 0. So, at a point when this reaches this point it now becomes it has a concentration that is positive above z equals to 0. So, at that point it will add this will add to whatever is being contributed from this plume. So, the second plume will add on to the first plume only after this point. So, it adds on. So, essentially what we are doing is we are, so this one thing about the Gaussian plume dispersion model is it is additive in the sense that I can add, uh, I can add contributions. I have 10 sources. I can add the at a particular location I can just simply add contributions from all of the sources okay. Because just like this and we will see that later. So, this is unreflected plume this is one just from the top. Okay. When you when you do a plume with reflection you add one more term here, this z component you add one more term here exponential of z minus h plus plus exponential <coughs> of you are essentially adding two things you are essentially adding this plus q by 2 pi u x sigma y sigma z exponential of minus of half y square by sigma y square plus z plus h square h square sigma z square you are adding this another this is another source. This is how you do source addition. If you have, if you have multiple sources, you just add, keep on adding these equations. Here, when you add these two equations, it becomes this. So the second source uh, adds up there. So this becomes the general equation for uh, with reflection. So these are different forms. The first equation here is this is the general equation for the uh, for any dispersion problem, including reflection, and one should take reflection into account because uh, it is there, and. Uh, <coughs> so, there are different uh, adjustments simplification of this big equation for different scenarios ground level concentration stack at height h which means right here in this term I write x y and 0 I am going to calculate the concentration at height 0 at ground level which means that I am interested in this is my source if this is my source this is my source at a, at a height h I am trying to calculate what is the concentration at a certain x at a certain y and at ground level which is z equals to 0. Usually this is what we are interested in we are interested in ground level concentrations because people are on the ground 
we are interested in computing ambient concentrations we will do z equals 0 typically. So, which means that this equation now will reduce to this simplify to this particular form. Now, we also say ground level center line what does center line mean? Ground level means z equals to 0 center line means y also equals to 0 sac height as h then ground level center line and ground sources which means this is 0, y is 0, z is 0 and h is also 0 something like whatever you are burning something on the ground you are burning wood or some such thing on the ground the equation becomes very simple it becomes a straight but this is derived from this first equation right. So, it is consistent with that 